Th thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. What an amazing symposium. I was saying to my friend Francis Arnold that I would have paid a lot of money to come, but fortunately you invited me so I can uh, come for free. Um, so Bank, when he wrote me, gave me this title of synthetic tissues. So I, I always do what I'm told by Banks, so that's what I'm going to try to talk about. Um, and, but what I thought I'd also try to do is, is embed in not, how, a little bit about my own background and how I got to the point where we're even trying to do this. So when I was in high school, like many of you, um, you know, I, a number of years ago, like I was good in chemistry and math, and I wasn't, or science and math, but I wasn't very good in anything else, particularly English and French and things like that. So my father and my guidance counselor said I should go to be an engineer. And I went to Cornell, and my first year, the only class I did well in was chemistry. So I decided I better be a chemical engineer. And then I went, so I studied that at Cornell, I studied that at MIT, and I got my degree in the 1970s. In the 1970s in Boston, uh, and actually in the entire United States, there was this gas shortage. And what happened was prices of gas kept going up and up and up. In fact, if you had a car in Boston in the 1970s, you actually had to wait in line for two hours to get your tank filled up. The good thing, though, is that if you were a chemical engineer, you got a lot of job offers. And pretty much every one of my classmates in, at MIT went to an oil company. So I thought that's what I should do, too. Um, I applied to oil companies. I actually got 20 job offers, four from Exxon alone. <laughs> and I wasn't that good. You know, they just had a lot of job offers. So, but I, I wasn't excited about it. I just, yeah, I remember going to one of the Exxon plants and somebody said, if I could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.1%, they said that would be wonderful. They said that would be worth billions of dollars. But I remembered flying back to Boston that night thinking to myself that, that I really didn't want to do that. You know, I kept thinking, how could I do something that I guess I thought with chemical engineering education, you could help people. So I, I actually thought about education. I, uh, when I was a graduate student, I spent a lot of time help, actually helping start a school for poor children in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near MIT. And uh, I got very involved in developing new chemistry curricula. Uh, and one day I saw an ad to be an assistant professor at uh, City College of New York in the United States, so I wrote them a letter applying for a job, but they, they didn't write me back. But I really liked the idea, so I, I wrote all, of, I found about 40 ads uh, to be assistant professor of chemistry education, and I wrote all of them, and actually none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so, so I wasn't doing very well. And I started to think, well, what other way? could I use my background to help people? And I, I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. They didn't write me back either. <laughs> then one day, one of the people in my lab, he said, Bob, he said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. But, but anyway, I wrote to Dr. Folkman, and he was kind enough to offer me a position. And that's going to lead to the first tissue that I'm going to talk about, which is blood vessels. So anyhow, Dr. Folkman had an idea. And his idea was that the way tumors were successful is they recruited blood vessels. And in particular, uh, his idea was that tumors started out small. They became abnormal. They'd grow to a three-dimensional mass. But they couldn't get larger than, say, a millimeter cubed because of a nutrition problem. Cells in the center would die. But the way the tumor, he said, solves that problem, he theorized, was by creating a signal. He called TAF, or tumor angiogenesis factor. And that caused the surrounding blood vessels, which normally didn't proliferate at all, to start growing right to the tumor. And that would cause a second phase of growth where the tumor is vascularized. It would get bigger and bigger. It could actually spread through those new blood vessels that's metastases, that's what often kills people. And then, but his, the, what we talked about was maybe you could, if you could stop this, maybe that would be a new way of thinking about treating cancer. And I thought this was terrific. Uh, it turns out that people were very skeptical of this. Um, and the job that I got was, could I prove this theory? And in so doing, could I, we isolate angiogenesis stimulators and inhibitors? Now. If you look back at the history of biology and medicine, very often people have what are called factors. And one of the critical 
issues in solving, of making a factor, I guess, real, is having a bioassay. And, and we didn't have any to study blood vessel growth, so we, we wanted to invent some. And what we talked about was maybe one way to study it was in the rabbit eye, that it was because you, you could visualize it if you actually put a tumor in, as I'll show you, or a polymer that might secrete a substance that would make blood vessels. Maybe you could follow the way the blood vessels grew with an ophthalmic microscope. It, as I'll show you, it would end up taking many months for this to happen, but you could follow it. And if we had an inhibitor, uh, this is from a paper we wrote in Science in 76, then you could maybe have a polymer that could release the substances that you'd isolated and see if it stopped the blood vessels from growing. So those were the kinds of bioassays that we wanted to develop to study blood vessel growth. We also, of course, had to find something that might stop blood vessels from growing. And one of the things we thought about was, was cartilage, which is in your nose or your knee. And um, so I started out getting small animals in the lab, but you know I, I couldn't get much cartilage. So I, I, I went to a slaughterhouse in Cambridge and I got uh, some cow bones. And uh, here's one of them. And actually, it doesn't come like this. Usually, it comes with a lot of meat. So I'd probably spend 40 or 50 hours a week scraping meat off the bones. I got, I got pretty good at it. Uh, and, but at any rate, and then you'd, I'd slice this off. And then we'd extract it in solvents like guanidine hydrochloride. And, 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 so, and then I'd put it through different purification columns. So that at the end of several years, I'd have all these different, what we call fractions, that we wanted to test. Now, the challenge, though, is that a lot of the molecules in cartilage were ionic, and some of them were large. And large molecules have very short lifetimes uh, when you put them into the body. Many are like 25 minutes or less. And of course, the assays took many months. So what we thought, is, uh, as we went back to uh, this assay that I mentioned, is that what we'd really need is a polymer that would be inert in the eye, which was very difficult. But probably even more difficult is it how to be able to release molecules of any size. Dr. Folkman actually asked people, he was on a board with Paul Flory, who'd won a Nobel Prize in polymer chemistry and others, and he actually asked, could they help us? But everybody said no. They said, this is really not something you can do. Large molecules can't diffuse through solid polymers any more than we could walk through a wall. And um, actually, the literature said the same thing. But the only thing that I had going for me is I, I hadn't read that literature. <laughs> so I tried to do it anyhow. And um, so I actually spent over two years in the laboratory experimenting with different techniques. I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. <laughs> but eventually I found a way uh, where I took certain solvent polymers like ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer, lactic like acid copolymer, dissolve them in certain organic solvents, usually doing these at very low temperatures. And then I was able to make these little microspheres. Now you can make nanospheres this way. You can cut it in half. And we published in Nature in 1976 that you could use this to release molecules of uh, any size for over 100 days. Later, using some engineering approaches, we worked out ways to get uh, constant release um, of, of, of this. So in 1976, I got asked for the first time to give a talk at a major scientific meeting. And I'd never given a scientific talk before. In fact, the only talk I'd given before this was in eighth grade. And, and that didn't go real well. I, I still remember it like it was yesterday. In eighth grade, I had to give this minute and a half speech. And I wrote it out. And I spent the night before practicing in front of my parents' mirror for three hours. And then I got up in front of my eighth grade class. And I started reciting it. And for the first minute and two seconds, I did OK. And then I, I couldn't remember the next word. And I just stood up in front of my eighth grade class for another minute until my teacher finally told me to sit down. I, I didn't, and that next minute I said absolutely nothing. So my eighth grade teacher finally told me to sit down and, and gave me a not very good grade. It, it was actually F. Uh, <laughs> so ever after that, I got very nervous about that. But I'm going to try to not do that today, by the way. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, so. Now, many years later, I had to give this 20-minute talk, and I stopped about two weeks before it, and I kept practicing my talk into a tape recorder. And the day came, and I got up, and I gave the talk, and it was in front of a very distinguished group of polymer scientists and engineers. And this time, I thought I did a lot better. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say or stammer too much. And I thought when I was done with this talk, all these you know, very famous chemists and engineers being 
nice people, would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, I, I stepped off the podium and a whole bunch of them said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> and in particular, they said what was said before, that the large molecules can't get through the polymers and that we were using organic solvents and that would destroy whatever we put in. And actually, things kind of went downhill from there. Um, what happened is, is my first nine grants got rejected. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, I was a chemical engineer and I actually loved being a postdoc. I, I really enjoyed it. But a lot of my friends probably told me it wasn't a good idea to do that for my whole life. And um, so I, I applied to be an assistant professor at different uh, colleges in chemical engineering. And not a single chemical engineering department in the United States uh, offered me a job. I think, I think they felt all this combination of biology and engineering didn't make sense. So I didn't get any jobs in chemical engineering. I ended up getting a job in a nutrition department. And, and that was actually fine, except the only problem was that the year after I joined the department, the department head uh, left. So, and he was kind of like a benevolent dictator. He just hired whoever he wanted and didn't care what the rest of the department thought. And, and so he left, and then a lot of the, they had uh, several associate heads of the department, and they started to give me advice, and their advice is I, I should start looking for another job. <laughs> and, 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 and just to back that up, uh, I had a very, very good friend, uh, a great scientist, Michael Marletta, uh, who's now a professor at Berkeley, and he was giving a speech on this a couple of years ago, and I just took a direct quote from that. He was just saying, uh, here's his title, he, Mike's a member of the National Academy as well. He said, uh, one evening he went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. He said, a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar. And he said, when the older scientist heard my concepts for polymer drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face. I remember that. <laughs> and he said, you better start looking for another job. And then Mike said, I thought I was in a Fellini movie. <laughs> so, but, of course, the, the key in so much of science is ultimately people reproducing what you do. So, what, what happened was, is, and then the question shifted to how could this work? So, to understand it, I had another student, Rajan Bauer, and we'd cut thin sections with a cryomicrotome through the polymer. Here's a thin section of one of those polymers. And if you had molecules 300 molecular weight or greater, it doesn't go from one side to the other. But if you put a drug in, this is just a, a reddish, molecule, myoglobin, as a marker, what you see is, uh, this is before any release, is a phase separation. The polymer's here, the drug is here. If you release this, say, for a year or two, it looks very different. Left behind where the drug was are these pores. And these are pores that are large enough so that molecules, even millions of molecular weight, can get through. But we did a lot of detailed, like, microscopic architectural studies, and what you see is that the pores are interconnected, they've got tight constrictions between them, and they're actually incredibly winding and tortuous. So it takes a really long time for the molecules to get through. If anybody's been to my hometown of Boston, uh, it, it's got what we call high tortuosity, and, and these do too. And over the years, our students have developed a whole set of mathematical models and rules where you can predict how to control these pores. And so you can actually design these systems to get released anywhere from a day to many years or any time in between. Well, since we could do this, now we could go back and try to address those angiogenesis problems. Uh, and so first, let's see if we can make blood vessels. That's one of the tissues. So here is a polymer in the rabbit eye, and now we put a growth factor in it. And for the first time, what we saw is you can break brand new blood vessels. They'll go right to the polymer. And if you had the inhibitor, we actually, like I said, we act, I, this was we probably did about 2,000 eyes to see if we could find anything that for the first time would stop blood vessels. And here's the assay. This was from a paper we wrote in Science in 76. Like I said, here's the tumor, here's the polymer. And what you see is 10 weeks later, if you don't have this cartilage-derived inhibitor, here's the tumor. You see the sheet of blood vessels growing over the polymer. You can't see it. If you actually looked at these eyes three weeks later, it would be three-dimensional out of the orbit of the eye. It would actually kill. Uh, but we sacrificed them before. Yet, and uh, by the way, I should point out that almost every fraction we tested did not work. I always think of those as the controls. But they really are, if you think about it, they're isolated the same way and everything. But, uh, but, and then, um, but notice that, and we did this 21 times, so it was quite reproducible. You, you put the polymer here, you can just sort of, I'm sorry, the tumor here, you just barely see it. And the blood vessels are much sparser 
they're lower, and they actually avoid the polymer. Uh, and 60% of the time, these tumors did not grow. Well, well, this was 1976. It actually took another 28 years from the study we wrote in science before the first blood vessel inhibitors were approved by FDA. Really, it took billions of dollars work by great companies like Genentech. But then what happened starting in 2004 has been striking. Uh, and this may be hard to see in the back, but it, it doesn't really matter. It's just a table, and it's not even a complete table, showing the FDA approvals of all these molecules, starting with the Vastin, which is the number one or two largest biotech-selling drug in history, up till even last month, with, and they continue. So these, are, which is Lucentis for treating uh, macular degenerate, uh, I'm sorry, diabetic retinopathy. So these drugs now have not only been approved for many types of cancer, but actually in the case of eye diseases, uh, like macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, there were no drugs before this that could treat them. Now, for the first time, you can actually give some of these. They can actually reverse macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and the polymers, I wanted to tell you a story on that. You know, it, it also seemed to me that, and Dr. Folkman, you know, now everybody talks about patents, and that was, uh, it, but then, you know, in 19... Seven, in the 1970s, Children's Hospital, where I was working, and that's a very good hospital, they never had a patent. And Dr. Folkman, he was a visionary guy, he said, well, we should file for a patent. So we did. But five years in a row, the patent examiner turned it down. And the lawyer at the time, you know, they said, well, Bob, you are wasting the hospital a ton of money. They said, just give up. I, I don't like to give up. So I started to think, you know, and every time I try to explain something to the patent examiner, he didn't understand it. So I started to think, is there some way we can convince him to allow this patent, L legally, of course. <laughs> and like I said, I wasn't doing very well scientifically. So I mentioned to you in the beginning that when I first started doing this, everybody said you couldn't do it. Molecules couldn't get through this. And I wondered if anybody ever wrote that down. So you can do what's called a science citation search to see who, what people wrote about what you wrote. So I mentioned, like, so we published the paper in Nature in 76, showing how you could release large molecules. And I did a search and I, I, at what people wrote. And I actually found a number of good articles, but one in particular. And this turned out to be five of the leading polymer chemists in the world. I did the search in 82. Uh, and here's what they wrote. They wrote, describing this field, that generally the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, like proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates through polymers. Then they said, however, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising, that, that's a great word for a patent examiner, some surprising results that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed this to the lawyer, he was very excited, he flew down to Washington, showed it to the patent examiner, and the examiner said, I had no idea. He said, I tell you what, I will allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get written affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote this. <laughs> it's a, a true story. So I wrote them, and they were all nice enough to write me back that they really wrote it. And we got this very broad patent, and with that patent, uh, I got involved in uh, licensing it to companies, starting companies, and today there's all kinds of products based on this. Many are for drugs with short lifetimes, like peptides that, that would normally you can't swallow or put in a patch. They're, they're used by many millions of people. Some are even for blood vessels, like uh, one of the biggest areas has been uh, what are called drug-eluting stents. Stents are a way to keep a blood vessel open, but most of the time when you put them in, they close off. Now you can take some fairly toxic drugs that if you gave them systemically, um, uh, they, you, you wouldn't be able to get enough. But what you can do is put them locally on these little stents and they'll deliver the drug and keep the blood vessel open. But they're used in all kinds of diseases, mental health diseases, uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, and so forth. Um, so another thing that I noticed when I was at the hospital too, uh, as you can see, I started doing work in materials. And, and since I was doing work in materials, I was curious, like, how did, how, did, how did everybody decide what materials to use in medicine? So I started to look into this, and it was really interesting to me. What I saw, almost exclusively, is every time somebody used a material in medicine, it was a medical doctor who was really driving this. And what they do, because they urgently wanted to solve the problem, is they'd usually go to their house, and they'd find some object in their house that resembled the organ or tissue they wanted to fix. Here's just a few examples. So, I'll pick, start with artificial heart. Th these are all true. And in, in the case of the artificial heart, you go back to 1967, and people at the NIH want to make an artificial heart, and they said, what object has, is like a heart in your house? And they said, a lady's girdle. It's got a good flex life. 
So they took the material in the lady's girdle and they made the artificial heart out of it. That's 1967. That's actually still true today, 50 years later. But, and one of the problems that occurs when you use this material is when blood hits the surface of the artificial heart, the lady's girdle material, blood hits it, it can form a clot. That clot can go to the patient's brain, they get a stroke, and they die. But if you think about it, something that was designed to be a lady's girdle, it's, it's probably not the optimal blood contacting material. And this problem pervades all of medicine. Uh, just one other example, breast implants. One of those was actually a mattress stuffing. And, 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 but almost exclusively, that's what people did. So, you know, being a chemical engineer, I thought, well, maybe we can do better. One of the things that you learn in chemical engineering is, is design. And so one of the things, so we thought of a couple of approaches, and I'm going to highlight the second one more today. But one of the things we did, and, and this is a lot of what we've tried to do in drug delivery systems over the years, is ask, is rather than take things from your house, what do you really want from an engineering, chemistry, and biology standpoint, and then synthesize it? But the other idea, and, and, and this is one I'll, I'll, I want to spend a few minutes on, uh, which, and this started again at the hospital. Jay Vacanti was a surgeon who was a friend of mine, and he was in charge of the liver transplant program. And he started talking to me, could we literally make new tissues and organs from scratch? And so this is from a paper we wrote um, uh, uh, describing this idea. And our idea, uh, and, and this kind of simplifies it, was that you could take any cell type, and that today would include stem cells. You could, if, if you take these cells and put them into the body, um, they, uh, they don't do much. But the cells are smart. If you put cells close enough together, they can actually uh, reorganize themselves. In fact, the group at Berkeley uh, has shown that you can take mammary epithelial cells, put them close enough together, they can actually make ace and I and make milk. And what Jay and I thought about is maybe we could make a template for these cells um, that would help them reorganize. Also, the other thing that we realized is that pretty much everybody, when we started this, was always grow were always growing cells in tissue culture plastic in two dimensions. But in real life, so many things are in three dimensions, right? If you look at, the, if you look at your skeletal system or anything else, usually it's in three dimensions. So we decided what we really need to do is make the scaffolds in three dimensions. Um, we also needed to figure out the right cues to do tissue culture. Sometimes, and again, this also involves some engineering and biomechanics, sometimes to make the right tissue or organ, you have to put the right stresses on to get the cells to make the right things. So each of these steps ends up being important. And then you might put uh, this in it, you might actually decellularize it, there's a number of different things you could do, but this would enable you to make the tissue. Um, so just to go over a couple things that you, you do, one of the things is the polymer. So the polymer, uh, that we sometimes we try to use uh, lactic glycolic acid copolymers. These have the nice feature that they'll break down into water and, uh, and, and carbon dioxide, but they don't allow you to get cell attachment for certain cell types. So we also synthesize brand new polymers. Denise Barrera in our lab did this, where, where we made things that would look a lot like this, but maybe we'd add a lysine group and then through a carbodiamide reaction, you could really add almost anything you want, so you could really control the surface uh, and maybe add different amino acids. Then what you might do is convert these into a branch structure like this, these liver cells, or uh, Prasad Shastri, who was in our group, actually we thought, and this was you know, many years ago, why, why can't you use what are called CAD-CAM techniques, like computer-aided design, to make different shape systems and then use things like three-dimensional printing or foaming techniques to make them any shape you want? So ju just to speculate with you 40 or 50 years from now, and it's pure speculation, but let's say somebody comes into a plastic surgeon and they don't like their nose and they want a new nose. Well, what uh, we thought about is we could make a nose like this with the CAD CAM techniques, and this is actually 98% porous. So this is a regular nose. But let's say somebody wants an upturned nose. Well, that, that wouldn't be so hard. You'd take a little bit of this off. What, what if somebody wanted a hook nose? I mean, they probably wouldn't. But, <laughs> but, 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 but if they did, we'd just give them a little bit more. And then you could actually take their own cells, put them on this, and, and, and make the tissue. So I thought I'd give you a few examples at just a very high level to show you what's possible. 
Uh, and again, I'm not going into depth on this, but in each case, our students would do a lot of work to really understand the materials, the reactor conditions, the, the synthesized new materials in, in different cases and so forth. So first, cartilage. Probably a million people a year need new cartilage, and what we were able to do is put chondrocytes on scaffolds, and you could even put them in new mice, and we redid this guy's skull, this guy's cheek. If you look at the tissue, it's pure white glistening cartilage, and you can even do what's called histology. This is a way to really see whether you have the tissue, and you put stains in. Some of the things that cartilage has are what are called glycosaminoglycans, and there's stains for that. It has certain types of collagens, there's stains for that, that type, type 2 collagen. Here's the glycosaminoglycans, with, and you can even see the cells with their characteristic lacunae. And then finally, cartilage has what's called chondroitin sulfate, and that stains blue. So it really looks like cartilage. And I wish it was perfect cartilage. It isn't. It, it, it actually, if, if anybody's thinking that they're a runner and we can help you, we're not there yet. We're working on it. But what you can do is really help people, in some cases, who have different cosmetic issues. So. Uh, the Army actually uh, came to see me and actually Linda Griffith, who was one of my postdocs and, and now professor at MIT, and Jay Vacanti, and they asked us, you know, they have soldiers that come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, sometimes that don't have body parts like ears. Could we make that? And here is an example of what Linda did. She made a, a, a ear. Here's a high-powered scanning electron micrograph of the fibers. Here would be the cartilage cells. Um, they're going to keep multiplying. Ultimately, this will totally dissolve, and you get the ear. And this may look a little shocking, but there's no other way to show it. Here's the rabbit with the human ear. And, and the reason we do this is to show that it's safe, uh, because ultimately we want to do patients. And we haven't done ears yet, but, it will be, but we have done some patients. Here is a 12-year-old boy that my colleague, Jay Vacanti, operated on him. And like other 12-year-old boys in the US, he, he likes to play baseball. But if he ever got hit in the chest with a ball, he, he could die. So Jay operated on him. We made a scaffold for him, took his own cells, and Jay operated on him. Here is uh, what it is, and then uh, here's the x-ray. And he's now an adult and doing fine. So there are a number of examples like this uh, where you can do uh, help people in, in, in different situations like this. Skin's the next example that I want to go over. And this is now uh, different companies are developing these. Um, and, 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 and it's been quite dramatic. I'm just going to show you a very positive example. These are actually now FDA approved, what I'm going to show you, based on what we and others have done, uh, for both people who are burned, which I'll show you, and patients who have diabetic skin ulcers. So again, this is a little bit graphic, but there's no real way to show it. So I'm going to show you a two-year-old boy, very badly burned. Here's the product now. It's neonatal skin fibroblasts. You can actually cryopreserve these. You can put them on the child at the time of injury. Let's come back three weeks later, six months later. And like I say, these are now approved by uh, people for, um, in, in, in a variety of areas. You know, when we first published these things, it occurred to us that there might be a variety of applications for uh, these technologies. You know, one, of course, the main thing is to help people, but it also seemed to us that if we're making these three-dimensional scaffolds, that it could also be very useful for new drug testing, for toxicity, and things like that. So even if you couldn't succeed in vivo right away, maybe there's some things you could do in vitro, like maybe have an organ on a chip. And I'll just give you an example of that. Um, and this was done by Gordana Vanyak, who was in our lab at the time, now is a professor at Columbia, and others. Uh, and so what we did is we took uh, cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells, put them on a scaffold, and they made um, a characteristic ultrastructure for uh, cardiac tissue, sarcomers and intercalated discs. And just to show you what it actually looks like, this is six million heart cells beating at once. And, and I'm not moving this, it's just it's, the heart cells are doing it itself. So it's six million cells. And you can actually take an EKG of it, and you can put different drugs on to see how they'll behave for cardiac tissue. And many drug companies are now using this for, for new screening techniques to see if their drugs are safe. Next example that I want to give you is spinal cord. Erin uh, Levick was one of our graduate students, and she wondered whether we could help people who may be paralyzed. And uh, so what she did 
is design a scaffold that would kind of mimic the gray and white matter of the spinal cord. There'd be an outer part that uh, might uh, be nano patterned that could help provide axonal guidance, and an inner port part which should be uh, have large pores and could be seated, seated with neuronal stem cells. Here we collaborated with Ted Tang, who was a neurosurgeon, and Evan Snyder, who was a neuronal stem cell expert. And here's a picture. This is the scaffold. Here's the inner part, which is porous. The outer part, which, using a sublimation technique, uh, has these nano patterns. And the experimental model that Ted Tang uh, and Aaron developed, and actually they ultimately we've used four different models, but the first one, which I'll just highlight, is this. You can actually make the rats paraplegic by taking out a uh, four millimeter hemisection of the spinal cord. And when you do that, um, well, let me just uh, show you what happens. You can, we did one of four things. Nothing, that's a sham operation, cells by themselves, polymer by itself, or the polymer cell um, system. And so the idea is that when you have this gap, uh, from a contusion, and you put the scaffold in, it almost kind of has a bridge. And you get what are called fewer cysts, you spare some white matter, you even get some remodeled tissue. And particularly, though, what we look for the most is, is what happens in terms of function. Can the rats do better? So typical control, so we all did this every time within 24 hours of the operation, and then we would do the scaffold. But if you, and we did 13 animals in each group, and if you put uh, do nothing or cells by themselves, this is what you get. Uh, the animal can't bear his own weight or her weight. The paws, look at the paws, they're splayed in an awkward fashion. There's what's called the BBB scoring system. Uh, 20 is what a regular person would get, he, he would get a five. But when you put the scaffold, when you put the cells in, you also get a five. Interestingly, the scaffold by itself gets about an 11 and the scaffold and cells gets a 14, which is hardly a cure, but let me just show you the difference. And this is from the mean of the uh, treated group. It's been published. Uh, and this animal, even though he's kind of heavy, is able to bear his own weight. Also notice the paws. These are some of the characteristic features that enable you to see whether there's a difference. Um, yeah, my wife told me I shouldn't leave that on too long. Um, so then what's happened is they actually repeated these experiments in non-human primates, got almost the same results, and then the company licensed this, uh, got it, and, and, and they've now gotten uh, what's called FDA approval to start clinical trials. They've now got institutional review board approval at 31 hospitals. And basically the idea is if somebody gets paralyzed and now they do it within the first week after the injury rather than 24 hours, that's the protocol, you image it with MRI and you slip the scaffold in. They decided to do the clinical trial without the stem cells just because from an FDA standpoint it's a lot more complicated uh, and they got as you know, our, our results were somewhat better with the scaffold itself, even though they were a lot better with the scaffold and cells, but that's just, a, I guess, a business decision they made. But it's been very exciting what's happened. It's really early, but let me just show you the first patient, 25-year-old boy who was in a motorcycle accident in Arizona, and they uh, operated on him, and here he is three weeks later. I'm sorry, three months later. Can we get the sound? Not, not that sound. Anyhow. It's largely, this is still a safety trial, but there's no adverse events. Um, he has active movements of his hip flexors, palpable contraction of knee extensors. That's his sister, by the way. Uh, he had no bowel function initially, that's regained. No bladder function, and that's improved. Here he is at nine months. And so you, and this is no water. Um, and um, what they've done, still early, but just to show you where they are in the clinical trials, um, the mean is generally about 15%, but five out of the eight patients that have been followed long enough and treated uh, have, do, have gotten what's called conversion, meaning they there's a, what's called an Asia scoring system they use for spinal cord repair patients. So five of them have had some conversion uh, with, like that young man. Again, it's too early to know what'll happen and they're doing a much more extensive trial. 
um, to see. But it's, it's been encouraging to see that tissue engineering might, might help in that area as well. The last example I want to talk about is uh, pancreas. Uh, and, and, and here I want to again show how you might use chemistry and, bio, and engineering to help. Uh, and, and, I, and this is a problem that the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation called me up about 10 years ago to ask whether we might be able to help because of some of what we've done in materials. And in particular, there's a strategy that people might use, want to use for diabetes. I should point out, you know, all the other systems that I talked about, you might ask, would there be rejection? And the reason there's not rejection, and depending on what you're doing, is we might use the patient's own cells in some cases. We might use um, uh, no cells in some cases. We might uh, give immunosuppressive drugs. That's actually what they do for transplants now. But one of the other things that we thought about is, could we come up with materials that could cause where you wouldn't have to worry about any of that? So if you had a pancreas, one of the things that you might do, and in that case, is put what are called beta cells, these are the insulin producing cells, inside a membrane. And if you had the membrane parameters just right, glucose, which is a small molecule, and insulin, which is a little bigger, might diffuse back and forth through the membrane. But the things that cause rejection, like inflammatory cells or antibodies, they're much bigger, and they can't get through. So the idea is, could we make a device that could have just the right pore structure, but protect them from the immune system? And people have worked on this for a long time. And one of the materials people love to use is alginate. Uh, and that's actually in seaweed. And one of the things that is nice about alginate, see, we do a lot on microencapsules. Almost all the time when you do microencapsulation with polymers, you use what are called organic solvents. And that, that might, as I showed you, they can work for some complicated molecules. But they do destroy cells. Cells are much more fragile. The nice thing about alginate, it has all these charged groups. So if you just shoot it, and I'll show you this, into a, a bath of a calcium or barium salt, it'll immediately form a bead, and the cells will be encapsulated. And it's just done in water, so it's very, very mild. So this is what's done. You put the alginate in the nozzle, you shoot it like this, and as soon as it gets to the bath, it forms beads, and the cells are right inside. And that would be great, except for one thing. Alginate is not sufficiently biocompatible, and the body recognizes it as foreign. So what the, and, and I should tell you, probably there's been billions of dollars spent on this. Many companies, this, ha, this issue has stopped it every single time. And what the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation asked is, is there some way that we could create materials to keep cells alive and functioning and not get discovered with scar tissue? And that's, this is what we're, we might call uh, super biocompatible materials. And uh, also, it's not simple because a lot depends on the animal model you use. That's why when lots of people did it, um, you know, some animals it actually would work in, but with others you'd get fibrosis. Um, so Dan Anderson, who was one of my uh, postdocs, he's now a professor at MIT, and I thought, well, maybe one way to do this, because it's the whole issue of biocompatibility is incredibly poorly understood. But we thought we might be could use some what I'll call high-throughput chemistry approaches, develop high-throughput approaches to try to address this problem. One of the biggest problems, of course, is if you have tissue, how do you evaluate it? You know, for 70 years, it, th this is almost archaic, but there's no other way. What people do when they put any implant in a person is the way they evaluate is to take it out, um, and then they might look at it optically, or even by what's called histology, and that's what I showed you before. That's, that's how everybody does these things. And it's incredibly slow. We want it to be able to speed things up. So what we talked about was maybe developing um, a mouse model where we could do it faster. Uh, sometimes people call this a high-throughput mouse. I think at best it's a immediate-throughput th mouse. But still, what we would do is we would uh, inject different capsules in, uh, into the animal. And if there's going to be inflammation, usually you'll get reactive oxygen species. And so you could inject a dye that might react with them, like luminol. And if these light up, that tells you uh, pretty quickly that you, at least as a screen, that you might have that problem. And so we use this as one tool. And we also found, interestingly, that the size of the materials ended up, this was published in Nature Materials, of these capsules made a big difference. As they, th these are different dyes that will aim at whether there's cellular material or fibrous tissue. And as you make the materials bigger and bigger, uh, actually the response goes away. 
here you see this is smooth muscle actin and different collagens, and, as, and you get less and less deposition as the materials get bigger and bigger. So we were going to use reasonably good sized materials, and then what we were going to do is create robotics. We did this with com in conjunction with companies uh, that would work 24 hours a day to make these. And we made all kinds of alginate derivatives, thousands. This was published in Nature Biotech. And, and this kind of summarizes what we would try to do. We would basically uh, start with alginate, and then we would do various derivativizations to come up with novel material designs. And here's the robots. We characterize the materials extensively. I should point out we've purified these extensively, and there are many different controls that, that have been done to look at uh, different uh, types of other possibilities that might cause a problem. We do this capsule formation and islet uh, encapsulation. Here, like I say, is the high throughput mouse, really the medium throughput mouse, showing inflammation. We actually then put the capsules in, in different animal models, and actually even in different locations. Then finally, diabetic rats, and finally, non-human primates. Again, just to show you what happens, if you use regular alginate, uh, this is in non-human primates, you actually get very nice capsules, compact islets, uh, but what happens is, even though the, you get uh, fibrotic overgrowth, you get a lot of blood vessel growth, and the islets are dead by four weeks. However, when you use the best of our materials, and, uh, and, and we're looking at the mechanisms of these, you know, it, it turned, there's different types of uh, chemicals that we're looking at. Um, a, a lot of these th ones that work best, and, and like I say, we've looked at thousands, are different uh, triazole analogs. And, um, but what you see in, in this case is an intact capsule, compact islets, uh, all of them are clean and literally no fibrosis, and we've looked at this several ways at four weeks. Uh, and in terms of viability, um, it's pretty much, this is again after four weeks in primates, now we've actually got it out to six months, but you basically get pretty good vi viability. Uh, here actually at six months in interperitoneal, you, you see almost no encapsulation. And, and you can actually, just as a proof of principle, another thing that Dan and Omid Vieths did, um, we we're actually getting more and more at what's going on with the materials. You can actually take FDA-approved peritoneal catheters. If you put them in animals, after 12 weeks, this is pretty typical what you get, whereas if you coat them with the materials that we had, you get this. And finally, just to go over the problem we're trying to solve, and, and this is the end of the talk, in diabetes, these are just from papers that we've written in Nature Medicine, and uh, that if you make a diabetic animal and you take rat islets and put it in these capsules, you can control blood glucose for uh, over 200 days. And on the very last slide, uh, this is a collaboration with Doug Melton, uh, who's made actually human islet cells. Uh, you can actually, uh, here's a typical control with no cells. Here's a healthy mouse. And with the encapsulated cells, you get control for Again, in this case, we, we, we stopped this experiment at, uh, at about 175 days. So, so these are some of the things that I wanted to share with you. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it, this has been incredibly exciting because it, it really, like I say, it goes back to my college dream to try to use chemistry and engineering to help people. And I, we're really just at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're, we're trying to learn more about the mechanism of these things. We're trying to move more and more of these into patients. But to me, it's just been a thrill to use chemistry and engineering to try to help people. And I hope, like I say, people here, our students, and people around the world can use these kinds of approaches to relieve suffering and prolong life. Thank you very, very much.